Right, well, we will get ourselves on the rock and roll, I think, then. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, officially, officially to this uh, chat. Um, we've got a absolute corker lined up for you all this evening, and I feel quite sure that you're all going to enjoy it. Um, if you've not visited one of these chats before, then you'll know that, uh, or you won't know, that I start off with a, a cheeky uh, video, which I've spent a few uh, minutes preparing, and today is no different. Enjoy. People told me to keep my feet on the ground. I didn't listen. just a sense of pride when you get on the trampoline wearing a leotard that's got the British flag or something on it you just want to do well for everyone. You enjoyed that i hope you enjoyed that well we are of course joined this evening by gymnastics royalty ladies and gentlemen um quite possibly one of the most accomplished british trampoline athletes that um our sport has ever has ever had i mean this amazing sportswoman has excelled at the highest level and sustained an enviable career that's spanned almost 30 years uh with a burgeoning trophy cabinet that uh, boasts medals and accolades from every major championships um, of, that the sport of trampolining has to offer and from every corner of the globe, um, as you saw in our intro video, um, her most notable career milestones, double Olympian, European champion, um, four times British champion uh, and world number one. Wow, I mean, just, it was amazing. I mean, <clears throat> her, her life's cup is full to overflowing. Uh, she, uh, on top of her relentless training regime, because obviously she's still training, she manages to uh, produce her own uh, leotard line with Milano, the Collection K uh, limited edition series, 
She donates a huge amount of her time to other clubs up and down the country, um, including her, her home club or one of her home clubs, Apollo Trampoline Club up in Sunderland. And somehow, <clears throat> Amidst all of that, she manages to find a little bit of time for her husband, also an ex-British uh, trampolinist, Gary Short. Ladies and gents, I'll tell you what, it gives me great pleasure to welcome tonight the queen of British trampolining, Kat Driscoll. Kat, come on in, my lovely, come on in. Hi, everyone. Hooray, we got there. I'm glad my camera wasn't on when that was played. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my love, how are you? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Uh, I am all right. I'm all right. Fine and dandy, dandy and fine. Thank you so much for coming tonight and uh, participating in our chat this evening. Most thanks for having me. Oh, well, you're, you're most welcome. Um, <laughs> just just a real quick one for everybody. If, uh, if anyone's got any questions that you'd like to ask Kat um, at any point um, throughout this uh, meeting, please stick them in the chat box. Um, and then if there's uh, some good ones in there that um, I, I'm not going to cover as part of my interview, then uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourselves and you can uh, you can ask Kat yourself. So please do stick them in the chat as we work through this and uh, yeah, we'll have some fun. Amazing, amazing. Right, so Kat, my lovely, um, it's been 28 years, 28 years since you took those first tentative jumps on a, on a trampoline you know, back in the day. Um, I mean, after 23 years in the sport myself, my, uh, my poor old knees are certainly feeling it. And, um, you know, <laughs> they haven't, absolutely haven't taken the pounding that yours has. Um, how are your knees and ankles doing these days? No complaints from me. Um, pretty good, to be fair. I think I, we can't complain. The sports science we've got around now, like, enables us to keep our bodies kind of going much longer than I guess previously we would have. So, can't really complain on that front. I mean, of course, injuries just—it's so prevalent in in those sports where height and impact. Um, play a role and obviously trampolining is a, a certainly carries both of those elements in abundance um, and you know you hear all these dreadful stories about sportsmen and sportswomen that are taken out of you know their, their chosen career because they they have a, a nasty injury of what you know <sighs> awful awful but how have you managed to avoid injury um, you know that, that's been big enough to, to take you away from the sport at any point how have you managed to sustain the longevity that you have great coaching Hooray! We love great coaches! Woo! Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. I guess I've always been a bit of a daredevil, but I feel like I've always known my boundaries. So I feel like I've never pushed it too far or I've never tried to do anything I've not been comfortable doing. Um, I've always trusted the people around me. So I've always felt like I've had freedom to, I guess, just, I don't know, I've always felt safe. I've never really not felt safe. I've I guess the conditioning helps. I don't know if there's a certain way your body's just built that doesn't break as easily. I don't, I don't really have any magic answers on that one, but can I can I just underline that with uh, with, with all of <laughs> with all of my gymnasts? But I'll bet that for all of those coaches of you that are out there watching this, uh, th this I feel quite sure that you can echo that conditioning gymnasts. It's a good thing. Do it. Do it as hard as you can. It makes trampolining so much easier. <laughs> Absolutely. So you were born in uh, March 1986 in Chatham in Kent to Mummy and Daddy Driscoll, uh, Mike and Pam. Uh, love, love Mike and Pam. Um, and you attended Rochester Grammar School for Girls um, at secondary age and then subsequently uh, Mid-Kent College to study a BTEC first diploma in sport. Well, that all sounds very exciting. However... <laughs> Oh they didn't like me doing sport at my school. It wasn't a thing. I did. Must admit, I wasn't lucky in that sense. But I went to an all-girls grammar school. We couldn't. We didn't even do PE as a GCSE because it wasn't academic enough. Um, and I had quite a few teachers tell me to stop wasting my time with it. So it's quite satisfying now to be like, I wasn't really wasting my time, was I? <laughs> yeah, sp sport will never amount to anything. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> apparently. Apparently. <laughs> um. So. At the age of seven, you got onto a trampoline for the first time at a, a school holiday summer camp at your local leisure centre. I mean, did, did you have any idea, any idea at all, that those clumsy first set of seat landings was going to turn into the glittering, glittering career in the, uh, the old bouncy, bouncy world that you've enjoyed? Um, simple answer to that is no, because I was terrible. <laughs> I wasn't very good when I started. Um, I kind of, my mum 
kind of the coach spoke to my mum at the end of the week and just said, Oh, like, do you want to bring her along to the club? Like, she's picked it up pretty easy, all this kind of stuff. And my mum asked me, and she said, You were just a bit like, No, I'm not really that bothered, but whatever. Like, I did every sport, so it wasn't, it was just kind of like, Okay, I'll give it a go. Um, and it was only when I got to the club and I'd gone a couple of times and I saw the bigger kids that were there and the bigger skills they were doing and found out about the competition side of it. That's when I was hooked because it was the bit of like, I love the competition side of it. That's the bit that drives me is the bit of like going out and competing and that extra bit of adrenaline. But I wouldn't say I was absolutely hooked from the first time I kind of got on the trampoline and I, had, I hadn't seen it anywhere else. And there was no burning desire to be like, oh my God, mum, I want to go and do that. It just kind of happened really. And then I just kind of did it because it was fun and I had some really good friends and you know, it's just, you know, and then I just, here I still am. Here I am. It hasn't really changed. I still do it because I love it and there's loads of good friends and it still makes me smile in the same way it did when I was seven or eight, so. It's like yeah. that, uh, that that amazing party that you go to and you, you never want to leave it because it's just so amazing and the music is so good and everyone's yeah. company is so great. And you then it's... This, what else do you do? <laughs> I mean, come on, what gets better than this? <laughs> no. As far as I'm concerned, uh, and, and everyone, everyone that knows me knows that I'm like a trampoline super geek. So yeah. uh, no, I, I'm with you, my love. Best kind of geek to be, that is. Hooray! So <laughs> you got talent spotted by a coach at the age of eight um, and obviously been trampolining ever since. Who, who was that, that coach? Because that, that may very well have been a really important sliding doors moment um, where, you know, this way you go to world championship, world international stardom, and then this way you end up uh, working for HSBC. And we'll talk yeah, about it, was, it was just one of the leisure centre attendants. It was literally just someone that taught it in the half term thing. He didn't even coach at the club. Um, he just suggested going along to it. Um, and then when I got to the club, um, I was coached by a guy called John Beckford, who I actually still am in contact with now. Went and stayed. He lives in New Zealand now. Um, I went and stayed with him um after the Rio games um and he actually flew over from New Zealand to watch me in the London games and I didn't know that he'd done that and it was only when we I'd met up with them, my mum dad and everybody afterwards and then they're like John's here by the way and so like they'd managed to get John to come and find me come and meet me and got a really nice photo of the two of us hugging at the end and I hadn't seen him since he'd moved to New Zealand but he was pro I think he was the very first trampoline coach that I've classed as my first trampoline coach and Still speaking to this day, and his daughter was like my best friend growing up. We were birthday twins, we're two years apart, but born on the same day, and it was really cool because he he then became through that they we obviously became family friends, and it became much bigger than just trampoline. It became trampolining with family in a way. So I guess that changes your kind of the way you look at it as well. I suppose it depends if you uh, get on with your family or not. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that side to it. Luckily, we did. <laughs> so it was all right. <laughs> Um, so, so what happened next then? So you you, uh, you, you got talent spotted by this coach and uh, he went, you know, you, you're pretty good. You're pretty good, my love. We, you should you should keep doing this. Um, what happened next in that sort of first early part of your of your trampoline career? What, what club did you join? Where did you go? What did you do? It got quite interesting because so I was at um, just like a local low centre. It was two miles up the road from where we lived um, and they didn't offer it very often. But I picked up. I wasn't very neat when I first started trampoline, but I picked up skills really quickly. Like they didn't take me long to learn stuff. I mean, I couldn't straighten my legs or anything, but like I could pick up skills. Um, and I got to, obviously back in the day, guys, the grading was a little bit different. Um, I'd got up out of the regional grades to what was B grade back then, which I guess would be NDP seven-ish, that kind of thing, I guess. There have been so many transitions across, yeah, haven't there? It, Letters to numbers, happened. letters yeah. back to numbers again. Yeah, it was the one below, like, the national, it was national, but it was the one below the top one. Um, and it got to, obviously, that's when you start traveling around the country. Um, and I had a competition in Cardiff. And I remember the coach saying to my mum, this was a different coach, he was called Colin, who was at the club, he ran the club. Um, him saying that he was he couldn't go to the competitions with me. And my mum took me to the competition on her own, like, just me and my mum in the car and I went and did the competition just me and my mum like no coach no nothing um and I came second and we thought this was like amazing like I've gone to this competition I've come second it's a national comp and my mum and dad were having a conversation and obviously I didn't know this was going on I was still young at the time and they just been like something about this doesn't feel right like you can't be competing in a national competition and your coach not go with you it doesn't make sense so if a coach doesn't want to go is she outgrowing the club do we need to look for somewhere else and at the time the the, the big club where I lived was Jillian Jumpers and they were the ones that had all the big kind of stars as they kind of were back in the day. Like they were producing people that I would, we used to have a competition called the Kent Close, it still goes on now. And I used to go to that competition and just be like in awe of watching like the big kids. 
Um, and so my mum approached Martin and everyone at Jumpers and just kind of said, um, we're thinking about, like, she might have outgrown where she is, thinking about bringing her to the club. There was a bit of animosity between the two clubs at the time. It wasn't like a friendly kind of thing. I then started doing synchro with a girl from that club um, and jumped at national. This is back in the day, you used to have a national synchro competition as well. So my very first national competition probably was in 96 when I did national synchro. Um, and that was my first taste of jumpers. And then this was before the rebound centre was built as well. Um, and so I joined jumpers and trained in the Black Lion for a couple of months while the rebound centre was being finished being built. Um, I moved over and then I was at Gillingham for quite a while. Till I was, I must have gone there when I was like nine, probably. Ten, maybe. And I left there when I was 14, maybe 15. And that's when I moved to Reading um, and started training with Sharon because me and Martin had a big argument and I was really stubborn at the time. So I refused to go back and train with him. So mum and dad had to take me to another club that was 85 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little deeper. <laughs> yeah. did, uh, did you do any other sports while you were growing up? Or was it, was, it, was it just trampolining that you knew that you wanted to be betrothed to? No, I did everything. Um, I swam regionally. And I got to a point where my, my swimming goals, my trampoline competitions kept being on the same weekend. And it got to a point where each of the people were getting annoyed with me, swimming people and trampoline people, because I was trying to do everything. And they were like, right, you've got to make a decision now. You can't, you can't keep doing both. And it only happened that my swimming teacher at the time changed and I got a new swim teacher. And I didn't like the new one. I was like, well, I'm, I don't want to stay with her. I like my trampoline people. And I'm going to go over there. And so it kind of came a little bit by accident that I kind of, it was just that I didn't like my swimming teacher at the time. The trampoline seemed more fun that I kind of stuck with that really um but I did everything at school all through like junior school all the way through senior school did all the school clubs played them on the netball teams hockey teams like anything that basically I could do sport wise I was like give it to me I need it all like I want it all and I was did every school club afterwards that I could do that didn't interfere with trampoline in and um, so most of that was fine until I moved to Reading and then obviously it was a much longer journey to training um but yeah I love sport even still now to this day like I watch every kind of sport that I can watch on the TV, and then if we can get to sports events, I, I will go and watch pretty much anything. I love it. Huh. So, at what point did you set up a notice? Check me out. I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty good at this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should see where this takes me. Yeah. You know, at what point did you kind of turn around and go? Actually, I really do need to 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 take what I'm doing seriously and start really seeing where I can take this. Um, if I'm completely honest, probably in 2010 or 11. <laughs> Because it just still felt fun until then. Like, it was just, it wasn't, we hadn't been in the Olympics very long. It wasn't really a hugely professional sport at that time. We were still finding our feet and finding our way. And, like, I could still do everything I needed to do during the day and go and train on the night time and still be good enough. Like, it didn't ever impact. Because, like I said, I picked up skills really easy. Putting the skills in routines and stuff like that wasn't really that much of a challenge. Um, and so it didn't really, if I'm completely honest, I don't think I took it, like, fully, like, completely seriously as like a career until I'd left HSBC when we were all fighting for the games. So I think I left HSBC in the 2011 or 2012. So probably at that point, like just before that was when I stuck, because I was working full time, I went down to part time before I stopped working. So it was a bit of a process over probably about a year. So I reckon probably 2010, 2011 was probably when I really was like, okay, I need to do one or the other here. I can't do both. That, that, that's not the, uh, the the answer I was expecting you to give me. I was expecting right. something a long time prior to that. It was just, I don't know, like, I just found it easy. It was fun. Like, I just, I guess the problem was, because it was so easy when I was a kid, I probably didn't work hard enough um, or I didn't work as hard as I could have because it was so easy that it just, I don't know, it just all happened. And it, like, competing was the easy bit. I mean, training was the hard bit. Yeah. Um, and I love that bit when you've got your 30 seconds to go and show off whatever it is you've been kind of doing. Like, I love that bit. This competition's always went really well. I always enjoyed those. And I thought it just, just felt like something you just kind of did as a bit of a hobby. I suppose that's what it was. It was just like a little hobby for a long period of time. <laughs> so you took part in the, in the domestic competition circuit. Yep. Both regionally and then obviously nationally. And you started appearing at the British Championships in 1997. Um, Unbeknownst to you, of course, um, that event would see you participate every year since, um, and and in which you won't be Say that again. Until last year. <laughs> Till yeah, blasted COVID. Um, it ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, 
no one's going to ever hold that against you. That's not your fault. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, throughout all of those years, you overwhelmingly occupied a podium finish position, including the much coveted top spot four times as senior women's British champion. I mean, wow, wow. I mean, set aside the international accolades for a moment, and we're going to we're going to talk about those shortly. Um, as far as a domestic career is concerned, what you've achieved is like a truly remarkable achievement. Did, um, did you did you any ever set your sights on national level stuff, or was international always on the on the cards? Um, the national stuff, I think, because of the way it was always set out, it always just felt like it was a stepping stone. It was almost like it was part of the the journey you had to take to get to the bigger kind of place. At first, it didn't because I had no idea what was going on when I was a kid. It was just you get to compete. You know, someone takes you to a competition, you do it, you mess around with your friends all day, you drive home. It was one of those, like, you just, I don't know, I just had those, even when I went to the first world age, I did not have a clue what was going on. It was just this big adventure we went on kind of thing. I didn't understand the gravity of what was happening. Um, and then I think ever since then, it's always become about, we went through this period of time where every British became about what it qualified you to. So it no longer became about the British. And a lot of the athletes said the same thing. We were like, we don't feel like we go to the British because we're interested in becoming British champion. We go to the British because we know we need to hit a certain score or finish in a certain place to make a team. And so we said we needed to change something that made us feel a bit more like we were going to the British to just embrace the fact it was the, the British Championships. And mm-hmm. um, so for a while they stopped using it as um, a qualifying event. And then you started noticing actually everyone probably performed a bit better because it was more just about what you were doing on the day, not what it led to. They, they weren't necessarily hedging their bats or coming up with a game plan. It really was, uh, let, let's go at this full bore so that I can I can do the best that I can do. Yeah, because a lot of people started playing a bit of a game as well because you needed to either hit, score, or finish in a place. So you'd go for a while where some people would do like two set routines to make a final and then do the vols and stuff. And it was like, I never did that because that's not what it was about for me. I was like, I'd rather risk it or lose it than play safe kind of thing. I'm not I'm not good at the whole playing safe thing. Um, but yeah, like it, it felt much nicer when it became just about the British and not about anything else because it, that's what it should be about. It should just be about, you know, like... But I always, I never feel like I compete as well at those events as I do at internationals because it doesn't, it, it almost feels like there's more pressure because there's not as much pressure, which sounds really stupid. But I think everyone expects us to go and be like perfect when we're at a British because it's the only chance that a lot of kids get to see us compete. They expect us to be like perfect. And it always feels like there's more pressure for us to have to be good and deliver at British than there does actually like at a World Series Europeans. Which probably sounds really weird. I actually got the trophy here. Oh. It's a new one now, though, so it hasn't got all the names. Everyone takes a little, a little, a little step forward towards their screen so they can, uh, they can see it. Wow, look at that! But that's the new one, so I haven't got the old one. That um, they ran out of space to put everyone's names on the old one, so they had to get a new one. <laughs> but it hasn't got all the legends' names on it anymore, which is really disappointing. But they ran out of space, so like, what do you do? Well, but, but that then obviously means that your name appears on the old one and the new one. It's true. Yay. Oh, I'm quite yeah. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on someone to ask a question if that's all right. Um Lisa Perez, can you um unmute yourself, my lovely, and uh, ask your question that you put in chat? That was a really good question. Is there a particular move you struggled with learning? And if so, how did you deal with it? Um there was one, but it's gonna sound really weird the way I explain it, but I really struggled with filling half outs. Um, and it probably took me 18 months to really get it. But it's not that I could, I could do it in the rig and I could do it in the pit. And I could do it in the rig and I could do it in the pit in all three shapes and be fine. And into the pit, I could land it onto a hard mat, like level mat and everything. But just for some reason on the trampoline, I just couldn't take off. Um, so it, I didn't necessarily struggle to learn the actual skill. I struggled to allow myself to do the skill on the trampoline. Um, and we just kept going back a step and I could like go back to like filling one and three and go over and over that. And we just put no pressure on me having to do the skill and just found the other ways and other skills around it to build up the difficulty I needed. Um, kind of took all the pressure off it, kind of forgot about it for a while, came back to it. Um, and then one day Sharon told me to just get on with it. And then I did it. And then I was like, I can't believe I sat for ages doing that. <laughs> and like, it's not like I ever did it wrong. Like I hadn't, I didn't have any issues with like, I, under, I understood it all, I could feel it all, I could see it all. I learned, so I learned filling half out. Luckily, I, I grew up with a pit, so that always helped. But I learned it from like a full in, I learned it from a half, 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 and I learned it from a brani in. So we learned it in all the possible ways to see if it made a difference. But it was just that initial, once I knew that I was twisting it, 
I would just stop and not go. And everyone would be like, well, why aren't you going? I'm like, I don't know. It's, uh, it, it's funny though that that transition between the the, the supported training aids like a, a rig or a foam pit or you know uh, things of that order that transition from that stage onto the trampoline even though like you said it's you can do it with your almost with your eyes closed using those training aids to take that step and know that that's when it has to count you know you're on the trampoline you haven't got that training aid anymore it, it might feel or look like a small step to to everybody else watching but for the gymnast it's mentally it's, a, it's like a chasm that you've got to I jump. I think the problem with the pit is obviously you have to go forwards and it's that when you're on the trampoline then you know that the dynamics aren't the same anymore. You're not, the takeoff is going to feel different because you don't want to be launching a full and half in the way you would in a pit on a trampoline otherwise, I mean, game over. Hmm. So I guess you know, in your head you know that. Like, So I learned the full and half at Gillingham in the pit and then it was when I had moved to Sharon that I had it in the rig. So I had the pit bit first, the rig bit second and then eventually just, I mean, just literally within, because I was doing the full and half and full full build ups at the same time. And literally within like 48 hours of twisting the full half, I twisted the full full straight away because the preps were all ready. Like it was all, everything was ready to go. And as soon as I'd done one, I was like, oh, okay. And then <laughs> well, that, the well, that was easy. <laughs> yeah. It was that moment that, you know, when, and I, I felt this with coaching kids as well. You know, when you just like, they do one, they're like, oh my God, that's so easy. And you're like, I know, I've been telling you that, but it doesn't make a difference because until that, like, until that's the gymnast you, you trust yourself fully or at least 90% trust yourself to go like it doesn't make a difference what anybody tells you you've got to have that trust inside but it's so frustrating as a coach when you know that they can do it and you're trying to explain to them how simple it is and how good they're going to feel when they do one because I've seen both sides of it I've seen that side when I've coached kids doing it but then also I've had that experience with the gym master I'm like I don't care what you tell me you're not doing it I am like it's different what's going on up here is different to what's going on up there in your head so, yeah, that's probably the only thing I've struggled with. Uh, brilliant, Kat. Thanks very much. Really good question, Lisa. Well done. I'm glad you didn't ask me that question because I would have gone full twist jump, uh, <laughs> which would have been a mu much less impressive response. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick up one more question, if that's all right. Um, Scarlett W, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, you asked two questions in chat, but I'm going to pick on your second one that you asked, if that's okay. I think that, that ties in with this section really, really well. Um, as you were getting older, did you find it stressful trying to juggle trampolining and school? What a great question. What a great question. Great question. Um, it's tricky. There you go. Look at that. You, you've, Scarlett, you've left her speechless. She, she, hasn't, she hasn't prepared for that one. No, because part of it, like, no, I didn't because this is why I used to always get in trouble at school I never applied myself in school as much because I was always daydreaming about trampolining I was always like making up routines and stuff and like working out different skills I needed to learn or looking at results I was on the internet like looking at results of what people had done at competitions and I always did enough to get like I passed all my exams and stuff easy that was a problem like it was a bit like I was just really lazy as a kid so like trampolining was easy so I didn't try hard enough school was easy so I didn't try hard enough I did enough to do what I needed to do and all my teachers just always say to my mum she's clever in this she's not applying herself hard enough and whatever um the only time I started finding it really hard was when I've moved to Reading um and my mum would drop me off at school in the morning and we used to start school at 20 past eight she dropped me off at school in the morning she'd pick me up from school when we used to finish and we'd get I'd get straight in the car from school and we'd drive up the M26, the M25, the M3, the M4 to get to Reading. Like, up the M25 every day was just a right pain in the butt. And that was the only time I found it stressful was because all I wanted to do was, like, go trampoline and I didn't really care about school. But then I'd have to get all my schoolwork done. But then I wouldn't get home until, like, half ten at night and then repeat, like, all the time. Um, so I only found it stressful then because that was when I was, I think I'd finished year 11 and was going into year 12. And I that's when I decided. So I did, a little bit of school history for you all here, I did the first term and a half probably of year 12 and then just said to my mom and dad this isn't for me like I can't do it this way around I'd rather go to college and do something no you know I, I guess I just haven't picked the right subjects maybe I don't know um so all I did is I finished so I did my sat my A level English language or my AS level English language that year but didn't finish the full school year out that's probably the only time I found it really kind of really really stressful because I didn't know what I wanted to do other than go trampolining um but I enjoyed school and I enjoyed being with my friends and I enjoyed learning and stuff but 
nothing really engrossed me in the way that trampolining did. So that was probably the only time I really like really stressed about it. But then as soon as I made a decision and spoke to my mum and dad about it, it kind of just said like I just I just don't feel motivated to go to school. And it was a choice that it was year twelve. I didn't have to go to school. Um and neither of my brothers had done sixth form. They'd all gone straight into work. Um and so my mum and dad were just kind of like, well then what's your, like what's your plan B then? If you're not gonna do that, you're not just like gonna bomb around the house, what are you gonna do? So like, right, well I'll start college in September and I'm gonna and then obviously then um went through all the different options of things I could do and then that's when I went to make a college and did the sports course and that was just so much better because I found then on that course someone that actually did shop at Great Britain as well so I had somebody that understood a lot more of kind of what I was going through um so I probably didn't find it stressful just because I was lazy which isn't the best thing I should be saying to everyone but it's also proof that like I regret how lazy I was at school don't be wrong I passed my exams and stuff but I think I could have applied myself a little bit better so I don't think the stress came in because I didn't care enough if I could give some advice in the school thing don't panic about it and just have conversations with people about it like I just I just didn't feel motivated by it because nothing it wasn't drawing me in in a way so then once I spoke to my mum and dad about it and had a few conversations it made life a bit easier so I guess that would be the best advice that if you are worrying that you're stressed about it you need to tell people about it and know that kids that I've worked with or trained with when I was at Apollo I had a group of we ranged from, God, how's he, if he was the youngest, probably, like, was she like 11 or 12, all the way through to kids doing the GCSEs. And we could pinpoint straight away in training when they had exams and stuff at school because the trampolining suffered. Um, and I think know that it's okay that you can take a bit of a, a back step when you're training. Um, sorry, yeah, you can take a back step at training if you've got exams and stuff coming off at school. You don't have to be incredible at both at the same time. One will always be there when the other chills itself out. That makes sense. I'm not getting too into it but don't panic they'll both be there have you ever experienced mental block when trampolining and if yep. so how did you deal with it i think you will struggle to find a trampoline gymnast that hasn't had some kind of mental block um i kind of feel like it's it's kind of part of the sport in the sense of like you're doing a sport that's dangerous and it's scary like there's there's no beating around the bush like it's a scary sport it's dangerous you can hurt yourself um and there's always going to be an element of your brain trying to protect your body. And sometimes, like, your brain's telling you that it's not time to do what you're doing. And I really struggled in 2015. Um, I just overtrained to the point where I was training so well that I just almost became addicted to training. Um, and I just wanted to train more and for longer and do more and kind of just, I just couldn't stop. Um, to the point where just neurologically my body had just had enough like everything was just tired and everything was shutting down and then I started it was I really I really struggled doing half and really outs never done them wrong but I've seen people do them wrong and then at this point I started shutting down because all I could see was other people doing the skill wrong and because I was so tired and my brain and my body was so tired it wasn't thinking clearly so I kept thinking that what I'd seen somebody else do I was going to do so then I kept just not taking off for the skill but I couldn't understand that at the time because I was so irrational and my behavior was just so out of character I couldn't understand what was happening and I didn't know who I was supposed to say that to or that I needed to say that to anyone because I felt like I was what's the word like I, I didn't want to look stupid to my coach I didn't want to look really dumb that I was scared of something I'd never done and you know all those silly things you don't want to look I didn't want to embarrass myself basically is what I thought I would be doing if I told the coach about it um, and then it was only when I then just sat down in training one day and just cried and Trace was like what are you crying for like what is going on like we've, we've got to get to the bottom of this kind of thing um, and once we talked about it all we talked about all the, the issues that we had we then broke the skill down to all the, the bits that come before it and just took baby steps took the pressure off it to get out the routine went through the basics again and built it back up again and then anytime any kind of weird feelings kind of came up or any scary things came up then we talked about it again um, so the biggest lesson I learned with mental block and is one thing I always, always will say to people whenever they ask me this question is you've got to be open and honest with your coach. Your coach is there for number one priority, your safety, but number two, they're there because they want to help you. Like they love the sport and they want to see you progress. So don't ever feel embarrassed or silly or scared to say how you feel about something because once they know that, then they know what they're working with and they can find out ways to try and help you to, to kind of get past that. But if they don't know what they're dealing with, they can't help you. And then the problem probably isn't going to solve itself. So I would just say, 
just open yourself up to your coaches to just tell them what kind of you're thinking and feeling and I promise you you'll get over that block much quicker than if you don't speak to them it might be scary but it's worth it in the end well that sounded like a uh, that sounds like a, a brilliant answer to a, a, <laughs> that what I felt sure was a brilliant question <laughs> we were just we were going through the questions in the chat while you came back so you were just asking about mental blocks <laughs> It's, uh, it does always help when uh, the, the internet works in your house, doesn't it? I was just like, um... <laughs> How did your parents take to the, this new life that you were starting to cultivate for yourself? You know, having to drive you, like you said, 85 miles there and back to a, to a club. And, um, you know, w what was their support like as you, uh, as you progressed up the, the, the competitive ladder? My parents are legends. Um, in the early days, my dad worked in central London. So mum would drop him off early in the morning. She would take... And then obviously when he came home, she would drop me off at training and pick dad up on the way home, take him home and then come and pick me up. So dad didn't have a lot to do with trampolining at the start of paying for everything. Um, but yeah, my mum, my mum's just a living legend. Like she literally no questions asked. As soon as I said, right, I need to be with Sharon Wood. That's the club I need to be at. She was the national junior coach at the time. I was like, that's where I need to be, mum. I need to get there. She's like, Cap, it's in Reading. It's 85 miles away. And I was like, yeah, she went. I need you, if you're going to do this, you need to do it properly. And I was like, all right, went, all right, let's do it then. And that was it. End of conversation. There was no like, no time scale on this. There was no, well, try it so long, see if it works. There was literally no questions asked. She said, did I want to do it? Was I going to commit to it? I said, yes, boom. That was it. We got on with it. And it was just, mum would go to, so she'd take dad to the station at 5.30 in the morning. She'd then come home. We'd obviously go off to school. She'd pick me up from school. She'd finish work, pick me up from school. We'd drive straight up. So sometimes it would take two hours to get to training. You just never know what the M25 is going to be like. She'd sit around while I trained, then she'd drive me home, we'd get home at what, like 10, half 10 at night, and then she would just repeat, 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 and she never ever questioned it, she never moaned about it, like nothing, she just did it, and she just did it because she knew that it's what I wanted to do, and she wanted to support me to do that, yeah. um, and then my brothers loved it, because they didn't have to spend any time with me in the house, which was great for them, ah. they got free time in the house because the parents were out, but then also I got to go to loads of really cool countries, and they got to come along so we're too young to stay at home, so they loved it. <laughs> like my first international was in Australia like I mean you get to go to Australia for a holiday because your sister's doing a competition you get time off school like this is a win the second one was in South Africa so my mum and dad and my brother went to Mauritius for a week first and then flew over to South Africa and my brother was like you can keep this up well, this is great so it, I don't know it just it just seemed to fit it seemed to work with everyone what so I've got two older brothers and we're all two years apart um and they both did trampolining as well Rob the oldest one gave it up quicker because he didn't want to wear a leotard and Tom did it up until like he did like B nationals and he got to, like double backs in one of threes and might might have done half outs I don't know if he did half outs or not but he kind of did it for a little while as well so we kind of had the same we were in the same training group as well so we had quite a big group of friends that kind of all did it as well which was quite cool um and yeah they just I don't know just then just became routine I guess and we just what my mum really struggled with was then when I moved up north she found it really odd because then she's like what do I do with my time but they come to the life again <laughs> yeah and then they they kind of they've come to they've never missed a major championships I've done besides when we went to Colombia and I was just like absolutely not you are not coming someone had been shot and stuff when before we'd gone out there we all had like guards of us and stuff so I was like absolutely you're not coming to that but they've never missed a world or Europeans a British any of that kind of stuff like the games they've never missed any of those things and they've just it, I guess it just became life for them as well but they've never questioned what I've done other than the odd conversation I've had with my dad sometimes where, you know, you're like, is this right? Do I still do this? Like, is, you know, like, do I want to do it? And my dad's always just said, he used to cycle, road cycle and apparently had a bad accident when he was a kid and he, he got injured and never got back on the bike again. And he's always just said, you need to make sure when you leave, you don't leave with any regrets. So if you're ready to walk away now, then we'll support that. It's not a problem, but make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and you're not going to have regrets. So he was always kind of the sounding board of, like we'll be proud regardless but like think it through whereas my mum's more of like the emotional side of it that if I was like I don't want to do it I hate you but like, okay wicked like do something else then like whatever so I had I guess a, a good I had good sides to both of them like I'm, my dad's like the dead placid one and like the chill one and my mum's like the, the emotional one and yeah, it's really cool and I love like still to this day like I'm obviously about to talk about her and I love that my mum and dad come to competitions and like I go and see them and I meet up with them for coffees and teas and some kids are always like they don't want their mum and dad around I'm always like no come on I love it bring them like I love them being there everybody knows my mum and dad like even internationally like everybody knows who my dad is like obviously does all the photos but like well, I, I, 
I was I was just gonna gonna ask that because obviously your your dad, uh, as well as being your dad, um, has travelled around the world as the you know the, the long telephoto lens of British gymnastics um, as event photographers at you know this international event and this world championships and this British and da 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 da, da. and and that was going to be my next question is having your dad schlep around the world with you has that been amazing or yeah. has it been you know dad dad just you're cramping my style man just get away <laughs> absolutely not i'm always like even on the competition i remember world 2014 um well, there's a few things with my dad but world 2014 i'd come fourth in the world final and i was oh, like it's obviously it's that weird place to finish isn't it because you're like fourth is so close to medals but if someone had told me going in you'd come fourth at worlds i would have taken it so, you know it's that weird like oh so close but that was wicked and someone, I don't know who it is, but someone took a photo of me walking off the competition floor with my dad with his arms out and me with my arms out going and giving him a hug and stuff. And I was like, how many people get to share that moment with their parents? Like, he's not in my face and interfering. They, still to this day, my dad can tell you about five skills I do and I've been trampolining forever. So it's not, he doesn't interfere with my training, but he gets to share those moments with me. And I think that part of it is like, it's super cool. Like they're not, they've never interfered. They've never pushed. They've never like, they've let me make all the decisions and have just kind of, just proper chilled bit but then also got to enjoy part of it and mum always did the scoring so she was always up on the panels when we did all our domestic comps as well so it's kind of they've always been part of it but not like in my face yeah yeah oh really cool. i like it so your your national and international career you know you mentioned uh, competing out in sydney and south africa you know and, and this is sort of you still age 12 13 you know kind of age yeah. but um but it, it started to take off and obviously you were getting older and you were working with national and international trampolinists from across the country um can you remember at which particular training session or, or event or competition that your eyes scanned the gym and across a crowded trampoline, they fell on the hazel brown eyes of uh, Mr. Gary Short, who trained at Apollo in, uh, in Sunderland. Do you remember the first time you met him? Well, no, because apparently we found out after it was really funny to talk about. We'd both done a youth match together, but we didn't really meet each other kind of thing, if you know what I mean. Like youth, youth matches used to have an under-15 team and an under-18 team of girls and boys and there was five in each team and I was in the under 15 girls team and he was in the under 18 boys team but we didn't really like we didn't talk to the boys then so I didn't really meet him then and then I don't really know after that we just because girls rule and boys drool yeah pretty much <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know I don't really know like quite like I met him quite early on like we were quite I would have been quite like both of us been quite young but we just like just clicked as friends like straight away. And he didn't really have a choice because I just kept talking to him like the ring all the time. He's talking MSN Messenger, you know, back in the day when we didn't have all the cool phones and things that kids have now. So we used to like talk for ages on MSN and on the phone. And yeah, we were just like really, really good friends for ages before I ever lived up north. So it was cool because obviously I knew him before I moved up there, which is really cool. So for those, those of you who perhaps don't know, um, Kat eventually married Gary in 2010. Hey! Um, and of course Gary was himself a, 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 an ex-international uh, Great Britain trampolinist um, having competed in you know all sorts of international events including Eindhoven the world championships in Eindhoven in the Netherlands um, which which you competed in so obviously you've kind of competed your careers navigated together which was uh, which was really lovely um, although you've you've retained your stage name your stage name of Cat Driscoll but you are in fact Cat Short right yep that's right so and you just mentioned it so at some point near, sort of near the end of your teens kind of 18 19 kind of age you moved up north to sunny Sunderland and you started jumping at Apollo yes. so from Gillingham jumpers to Reading with Sharon Wood and then up to Sunderland um uh, so Gary who lived in Washington with his family at the time up in uh, up in Sunderland I lived with them too in their conservatory was he the reason that you uh that you you decided to take take the move it was a combination of things um partly um, I was, I'd applied to go to Sutherland University um, to primary school teaching. Um, I knew Bill pretty well because Bill was one of the national coaches. Um, and, you know, when you, like, you get to a point where you just feel like, me and Sharon kind of had a bit of a fallout because I'm quite a, like, I've always driven everything myself. And we clashed a little bit because Sharon wanted to be in charge and I wanted to be in charge. And then it got to a point where I felt like I wasn't allowed to make any decisions myself. Um, and I felt like I needed to spread my wings. And the only way I felt like I could do that was if I went far away to do that. Um, and university obviously was the perfect way to do that. Um, so 
there was there was a few different bits and pieces um elements of gary elements of bill elements of uni spread my wings always loved it up north i had some friends from the junior team emily and heidi up there as well um i just every time i'd go up and train up there i just loved the freedom that they had at their club that you would never had coaches on you it was all about you getting on with it and then they would help you yeah and um, so that was kind of one of the big calls and i mean i never went to uni in the end but i moved up there <laughs> So, so whilst you were, were up there, then you, you bumped into, and you've already mentioned his name, you bumped into a pretty incredible coach up there, Mr. Bill Leach, who is, uh, he is Mr. Apollo, having uh, started Apollo up in like 1964 or something crazy like that. And can you can you talk to us about training under his watch and what that was like as far as your continued development as a, as a senior? You know, you're a senior by this point. Um, yeah. How, how, that, how that worked? It was a breath of fresh air. Like I kind of said, I needed to feel like I could make some decisions um and kind of take my career like it almost felt like I needed to if like if it went wrong I wanted to feel like I had nobody else to kind of blame I wanted it to all be on me like if I made the wrong decisions I could live with me making the wrong decisions I couldn't live with somebody else making the wrong decision for me mm. um, and so Bill never never got in my face about anything and he never demanded things from me and he never told me I had to do this this and this or whatever it was just like whatever you want tell me what you want and I'll help you and he was almost like the right person at the right time that was the time where I was discovering like a little bit more about myself and trying to find out who I was as an adult um, and living away from home and what did I want to do with life and he just kind of was the perfect person that never yeah he was just never like he never got angry he was never like you never felt like he was disappointed in you. Like he was always supportive of everything you wanted to do and just, just chilled. Bill was just like chill. And that's exactly I, what I, mean. I think I've known Bill for, for over 20 years and I think I've only ever seen him. Angry is not even the right word. Oh, I've seen him angry, but it well, doesn't happen. Really miffed. I think I've only ever seen him, you know, raise his voice. Um, it takes a lot to get into that. Yeah, uh, only once in all of yeah. that time. Yeah, he's a dude. It's, I think it's just that chill nature. He just allows people to, you feel safe with him but he allows people to be who they want to be or discover who it is they want to be. Like it's never about creating the same mold of gymnasts all the time, the same mold of people. And he didn't care if you were, you were really good or you were really bad as long as you just tried. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I don't know. He's just a dude. He's just he's like a dude. dude. <laughs> Um, I'm right in thinking that uh, Gary, your husband, has now taken over the reins as far as being your personal coach is concerned. Yep. Yeah, so the, the difference with moving from Reading up to Apollo is that I didn't really have anyone of my own age or standard that I was training with. So I had a great group of kids that I trained with, but the most any of them did skill-wise was probably like a half and half maybe. Um, and so when I moved up there and I was training, Gary was still training us at the time I moved up there. And so it was really cool to actually have someone to train with that was well, doing better stuff than I was. It's been since Gillingham, since I've had that when I trained with Gary Smith. Yeah. Um, and so it was really cool to have someone kind of doing that. So we worked really well together in that sense. And he was always coaching me alongside that as well, because Bill had to look after the whole club. It wasn't like I had Bill to myself. Like it was, it was kind of a bit of a rec club, the way Apollo was run, that it was, you didn't necessarily know how many kids were going to turn up every day. Um, so there'll be some days where Bill would have to literally go and look after all the other kids because there were so many in. So Gary would always coach me anyway. Um, so it was kind of a bit of a transition period anyway, where I guess the older Bill got and the more the kids got and then the better the, the club was kind of expanding to. His needs for like needed to be spread out over more people than more than just me. Yeah. Um, so he'd. So there was kind of, yeah, I guess, a bit of a transition period with that. And then kind of like pre. Pre 2012, they were doing a lot of the work together anyway because Bill was coming with like he'd worked in the council so there were some days if he had to stay at work then obviously Gary was coaching me anyway so I, it was kind of I had the best of both worlds because I just had knowledge coming from like everywhere um and then yeah but I think I'm trying to think when we kind of made it officially official would have been I guess pre-Rio but pretty much that whole that like, whole pretty much that Sykes and Gary was doing like a lot of the work with me but I had both of them but Gary was doing majority of the work um but yeah he's so being a relatively new new kind of I mean it's not new obviously because you've been working together for such a long time but as far as sort of him officially taking over the reins of, of coaching you um how does that dynamic with him work you know with him being the coach uh, and you being the gymnast and obviously being husband and wife at the same time I mean, who wears the trousers in the gym and who wears the trousers at home <laughs> um 
everyone's always fascinated by this question and I always find it really funny because I'm like because I guess because we, we've done it for so long that when we train we train and then when we go home we go home and they're, they're they're separate in a way like we don't bring training home we're both when we're in the gym whether I'm having a bad session or a good session or whatever it is like he's only there to help me and I know he's always there to help me and even if I take frustrations out on him it's never like a personal like a tap kind of thing um I don't know it just just works just is uh, what it is you suggest stuff I'll suggest stuff do you have a rule that you're um you're not allowed to to talk shop when you're at home? Because uh, I mean I, I'm gonna hold my hand up. I, I married a trampolinist as well, and sometimes talking shop when you're at work, and then talking shop when you're back at home again. It kind of even for a complete trampoline geek like me, it gets to be a little bit of trampoline overload. Um, it's tricky because I would say if we do talk about trampoline at home, it's generally not about me on the trampoline. Because obviously Gary's the national performance pathway coach now, so his job is trampolining like so i mean that's that's our common kind of thing i guess um so we, we do talk about trampolining at home but yeah but there's no rules or anything that we're not allowed to we just tend to we have a conversation and what we tend to do obviously gary's obviously not out and about at the moment so he's working from home and um, we tend to i come in from training when i come in from training we have a conversation about what i've done in training on because i split my week between trace and gary at the moment um, so we'll talk about what I've done in training and he talks a bit about what he's done at work, whatever, and then that's it, it's done. And then we go to like home mode. So it's almost like you kind of have a bit of a debrief and you kind of talk about it, but then it's done and parked and we move on. So I guess it has its time and it works. Fair enough. And it works. Of course. And, that's, and that's amazing. Amazing. Um, so in 2010, I think that was a, that's a, a date that, that's worthy of discussion. Um, funding became available from UK Sports and this enabled you to, to go from, um, and you mentioned about working full time and then working part time and trying to juggle the, the, the needs of, of needing to, to have a job and to have income and, and balance that with the training regime that you had, you had set out. But 2010, when that funding became available, you could stop work and just focus fully on being a, a, a full-time trampolinist i mean how did that change do you think how did it affect how you were training and what your goals were and all of that kind of stuff well how it affected training a bit is dead easy i used to work in durham city center so i used to finish work at five o'clock and this is in uh, this is in hsbc bank hsbc bank yes um i used to finish it like the bank would shut at five o'clock and supposed to finish five o'clock but we never finished at five o'clock so by the time he left work and I'd have to get to the like to the bus to get back to the park and ride and then drive up the A1 to training, it could be like six o'clock by the time we get to training. Training's only on till seven o'clock. So there was times where I was only getting like an hour of training. And sometimes like the quality of that training would not be great because I've been on my feet all day at work and then we'd be rushing and not eating properly or whatever. So the, the biggest thing that changed was the fact that I could then plan my days out properly to be able to get to training, have time to get a proper warm up, like on the floor, a proper warm up on the trampoline, a proper like meaty session, a cool down afterwards. I had time to go and do conditioning and like think about my food and my meals and recover in ways I couldn't before. And it took a long time for me to find my feet with all of that. It wasn't like an instant, oh wow, I've suddenly done this and it all works now. It took a, a while before that all worked, but probably like six to eight months, I think, just because. Then in the day, I'd be like, oh, I'm bored. What do I do? Like, I've been on the go all the time. Like, from at work nine to five, I'd leave the house at half seven and not get back into like half seven kind of thing. And then I have to cook when I got in. So then suddenly, when I had all day to like chill, I was like, right, what do you do? And like, so then I found out I was really tired all the time. So I was really bored all the time. So then I had to find things to do to, yeah. So it was, it was, a, it was a transition. It took some time. But when it did pay off, it obviously massively paid off. Because in 2011 was probably one of my, what well, was the best year I've had to date. Yeah. Well, if it's okay, I'm just going to rattle off a, a, a choice few of your international achievements. Talking of, of milestone years, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll need to take a big breath because uh, I've got a pretty big rap sheet of events to pick from. <laughs> so obviously, the, the, as far as the rap sheet is concerned, most notable be the 2012 and the 2016 Olympics. Um, you know, making the, uh, the the final in the 2016 uh, event, which was amazing. And mi oh, I tell you what, missing out on that that eighth spot final by 0.01 in the uh, in the 2012 Olympics. Oh, four years though. Um, 2013 World Games champion, uh, uh, synchro champion with Amanda. Uh, oh, funny story about that. 
come back to that. 2019 um, silver team medalist. So, you know, the, the, the most recent world championships. 2013 double world champion, synchronized and team. Uh, 2011 world championships, second in the team. Um, and uh, that one obviously being held on uh, on British soil up in Birmingham. That was a bit of fun. 2011, you already mentioned that year, you were world number one um, in both individual and synchro with Amanda. I mean, <laughs> wowzers. You got a European Championships in 2016. You've got um, a second at the youth 2015 European Games. And then, you know, the British stuff we've already talked about. I mean, you must be knackered, my love. <laughs> it's a funny story. So this is my medal from World Games, right? They, um, they made one big mistake. They missed the L from Word. So I am the 2013 Word Games champion. Word. <laughs> How bad is that, though? Like, the medal actually says, um, we, I have drawn a, I've drawn a black L on it. I don't know if you can see it or not. But I've drawn a black L, but it actually only says Word. That's amazing. That's amazing. Come, come on, guys. Get your proofreading going on. But yeah, I've got, I've got loads of medals here, actually. This, this medal is wicked. This one's from um, European Games. You could kill someone with this medal. It is so heavy. Oh my god! How how thick? That looks like half an inch thick. <laughs> it's huge. Wow! But that one comes in like a posh, like little boxing and everything. Yeah, all my medals are like this. Is how I keep them all. They're all in a box. <laughs> so you go to the gym to carry that box around. It's because we don't go, we don't have trampoline and stuff in the house. If you know what I mean, like when you walk in the house, you would never know like what either of us do. I'm in the office, which has got the trophy, um, and like the box of medals are in here, but we don't have anything out anywhere in the house that's like trampoline related. So that when we come home, it is home. It's, it's just a normal home. Yeah. Um, having having competed around the world at the highest possible level and, you know, for such a long time and having been so successful across all of that, do any of those events that I've talked about or perhaps any others, do there any, any, is there any one that kind of sticks in your memory as being really special? You know, one that you really kind of cherish as a memory? This is everyone's favourite question. Um, I kind of have two. Um, one individually and one not so individually. 2013 Worlds was like unreal it was the first time that our team had been a team and i mean the great britain team the trampoline the tumbling the dmc team was one unit like nobody messed with that team like it was the most team unity we'd ever had um and we, we just felt dead powerful like i don't know like you walked in and everyone was like oh my god great britain's here and, like we never really felt that force it always been like our little teams we sat together we were dead loud when like everyone was competing like cheering and stuff we never expected to win that world. We, were, we wanted to fight for a medal because we'd won a medal at the Worlds previously, but we never in the world thought we were going to beat the Chinese like routine for routine. And then Emma went, smashed it, beat the, Chinese, the, the first Chinese girl. Then Laura went, smashed it. The second Chinese girl fell and I was sitting next to Trace and I went, oh God, oh God, and turned around and she was like, it's fine. It's the same routine that you do all the time on the same trampoline, like you're prepared, just concentrate on that. And apparently in the audience, they'd all been having a chat, like the d and and tumblers and stuff and been going, like we knew that by the point it got round to me competing, that I only have to do 10 skills and we're going to be world champions. So everyone's like, oh my God, we'll Kat do a set, like to play safe. And everyone's like, you've got no chance Kat's doing a set because that would be like, she just absolutely, I hate sets. That I, think, I think you were talking about regrets. I think if you had done that, and still retain the world title if you'd still done that i reckon that you'd be looking back at that now going i want to feel the same way yeah yeah so like and that and that feeling i have never been so nervous on a trampoline in my life like because that was the one moment where i felt it a bit in 2011 but i was like because i knew that i had to do 10 skills more than a win it was that bit of if i mess this up now i mess this up for everyone and it's not often we compete and you have that feeling because it is an individual sport, but it was you know, like, you know, when you're aware that all eyes are on you, 10 skills and you, all of you can be world champions together. Like you, nothing can prepare you for that. There's no training in the world you can do that prepares you for the emotion of that. And then I don't think I'm, a, I'm not an emotional person, but I'm not, not an emotional person. But like, I remember I cried on the trampoline when I got off at first and then I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I cried again and then everyone else was crying. And then it was like, everyone was cheering and it was just like, the emotions were just mental. And if I could go back to any period of time, like just being around everybody at that point, like just the, the realization of what we'd achieved and stuff like was unreal. Um, and so that's probably always going to be one of my favorite memories of trampoline, just because we got to share it together. And it's not often we get to do stuff together. 
Um, and then the individual bit of it would be London. Like, nothing will ever beat that. 16,000 screaming people in the O2. Like, that was unreal. Like, that experience. No matter, like, regardless of the result, like, that fueled me for four years. But it was that bit of, Trace said to me, when you get off the competition floor, how do you want to feel? What do you want to look back on it and think? I said, I just want to know that I had, I gave it everything I had on the day and that was the best I could be. And the rest of it, I can't keep, I can't take control of what anybody else does or the result or the only thing I can control is how I feel about what I deliver. And I want to make sure that I've left it all out there. And so I remember when I got off, I was third up, I got off after my ball and Trace went, well, I went, I couldn't have done any more. That's all I had today. That's the best I could be today. And whatever happens, happens kind of thing. And obviously we never imagined it would have been as close as it was. Um, and so the, initially there was a, a little bit of that disappointment. Trace had to say to me, but remember what you said. You said that was the best you could be. So you need to be proud of that. But I think like that, just that whole qualify, the whole process of qualifying to home games, like the opening ceremony was like, I wouldn't even know how to describe that. Like meeting all of my heroes out there, like sharing apartment blocks with them all, like knowing everybody in the audience was like behind you and knowing as well that I competed on Super Saturday is like, it's pretty cool. <laughs> 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 I, I, I was I was so lucky that I was able to get tickets um, at, at that 2012 Olympic Olympics to the to the men's trampolining final. I mean, I applied for tickets to the women's as well, but sadly, I, 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 I wasn't. So lucky. I decided it was fate because we'd applied for loads of tickets. We managed to get six on one thing and six on another. And then we got a load through like Team UB and through British Gymnastics or whatever. So we end up, we had people scattered all around the O2 and I could pick out individual voices where they were and I could see, like I spotted my brother and one of my like best friends was sat together and I could hear Gary and it was really funny because he was sat with my mum, my dad, Harvey, Alan and Bill. They were all sat together on in the BG seats and uh, Gary was shouting for me through my routine. And the woman in front of him turned around, she's like, excuse me, could you be quiet? He was like, really snotty to Gary. And Gary was like, no, I will not. That's my wife. It was really funny. And obviously I went up there after I finished competing to watch the uh, medal presentation. Done all of our um, like press interviews and stuff downstairs. I had a bodyguard. I thought I was mint. I had a bodyguard. Took me upstairs, went and saw everyone. And then that woman was like, oh, can I have a photo? And Gary, that's the woman that told me to shut up. <laughs> it was really funny. Then all of a sudden she wanted a photo. It took me hours to get out of the O2 after that. You know, you just don't think about it. And so the bodyguard was like, I really don't think this is a good idea. I don't think you should go upstairs. And I'm like, no, I want to go and see everyone. Like, like I hadn't seen anyone for so long. And um, yeah. So not, not normally at, at, at those kinds of national and international events, it, it's, it's so easy as a, as a gymnast and as someone that's on the competition floor to just go up the stairs and be in the audience and yeah. no one knows you. It's... Yeah. Well, they didn't for a while until then, obviously, everyone suddenly was like, oh, my God, is that her? And then, like, it was like little Lizzie Warren from Olga, like, she spotted me, she came over, and there was loads of trampoline people I knew. But then, obviously, then that everyone was like, what's going on over there? There's this big commotion, and it became bigger and bigger. And then we, they were trying to, like, get us out of the arena because they needed to do the security check to clear it all. And then we'd set up, like, a photo thing, and I tried to, like, do photos with everyone. And then they, they took us down back, and then I met more people down there. And then I remember Gary going to me, why is that woman staring at you? And I was like, oh, my God, that's my auntie. And I didn't know that they'd managed to get tickets for her to get to the pub. And then all these different. And then I spotted my first trampoline coach. And it was just wicked. And then we went for food and TGI Fridays. And I remember they they were like, my mum went and asked me to get out of the table. Because it was Tracy's birthday that day as well. So there was a, a, must have been about 12 of us. And I was like, oh, I'm really sorry we're closed. My mum's like, but my daughter's just competed in the Olympics, please. And they were like, seriously. My mum's like, yeah, look, she's in all of her kit last night. So they let us go in and have this big, like, table and did a big celebration. And we got to have, like, TGIs for ourselves and... It was wicked. It was just one of the best days ever. Gotta love TGI Fridays. Yeah. I mean, who, who, how else you celebrate a game? So you go and get a massive burger and chips. Like, it was brilliant. <laughs> it was great. My, my my daughter, Aliona, uh, she watched, I mean, we, we obviously watched the trampolining on the telly um, and uh, and she watched your your performance and, you know, you absolutely inspired her at the time. Um, and, and she was only three and a half, um, but she made me, she said, Daddy, film me, film me, um, which I think it's adorable. So actually, I'm, I'm going to share that with you and everybody yeah. else so that you can, uh, you can see that. She does, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So are you going to, are you going to bounce for us? Okay. Go on then. Who are you bouncing like? Um, bouncing. Who are you bouncing like? Um, cat. So cute. 
Do you think that she likes bouncing? Yeah! Do it! Do it! Can you show her seat landing? <laughs> Say bye bye cat! is the best sport out there that's why it certainly is it certainly is um yeah she's a <laughs> she's a fair bit older now but she does still love trampolining she's in a uh, our little trampoline squad and, and how can you not like you literally get to be i mean i mean i don't know but yeah, i get to feel like a kid every day just you know bounce around having fun so you've decided to continue for another four-year olympic cycle after rio um uh, which, which has sadly turned into a five-year Olympic cycle, <laughs> uh, or, or longer, depending upon what um, the COVID pandemic does to, uh, you know, the, the Olympics moving forwards. So with obviously with 2020 Tokyo um, being postponed until this summer, summer 2021, um, are you ready? Right now, no, but I will be. <laughs> we don't, well, obviously we don't need to be ready now. We, um, we're not going to our Europeans have been camp well we're not going to Europeans the European championships are still slated to happen but we're not going and um, the risks are just they're too high um so we don't announce and select a team until May or June so everybody's just training and getting ready to be ready when we need to be ready does that make sense what happens if um uh Olymp Tokyo 2020 turns into Tokyo 2022 it won't it's officially now or never. They've said it will not be. We had a meeting with Team GB the other day. It will either be happening in the summer or the games will just not happen. Wow. I bet Tokyo's got its fingers crossed. I feel like that's the best. You can't you can't keep postponing it because then you're also, then you've got Paris in, in three years' time now. You can't, yep. you can't keep it going on and on and on. It's, yeah, you're keeping both the, Tokyo um, and all of the infrastructure that's been put in place there, but most importantly, keeping all of the athletes um, on tender hooks and, and trying to keep up training regimes and all of that kind of stuff must be yeah. extraordinarily difficult. It's just crazy because every time you set your, we've set our kind of plan out. We had no plans when we first came back, obviously we had no plans because we didn't know where we were at. Um, and then you start making some plans and Every time we feel like we make a plan, then it's like, oh, that competition's cancelled now. That competition's cancelled now. We're now not going to that competition. So we've got one, one competition left in the calendar, which is um, a World Cup in Italy, which is the last Olympic qualifying event, um, which is supposed to be the end of April. That's the last kind of thing that's in the calendar at the moment, but whether it happens or not, who knows. Um, it's been a blessing in the sense of I've never trained for this long to just train. So I feel like I'm technically better on the trampoline now than I ever have been because I've had time to break everything back down and build everything back up and, and take time to do things that we don't normally have time to do. So there's a blessing in the sense of I've, I've never been technically better on the trampoline. Um, but then it's just really hard now that we've kind of gone through that phase of like training, but you don't really know what you're training for. So every time you train for something, it gets cancelled and then it's, everything gets pushed back. And you don't want to start doing things like your routine's way too early because you don't want to burn out, but you need to be ready for when something does happen so it's kind of a bit of a the last couple of weeks have felt the most kind of where you feel a bit stuck in limbo than any other time because that's when we found out we weren't going to europeans and all those kinds of things that then it's like right then when are we going somewhere what's happening so yeah it's one of those things it's, it's kind of it's kind of the same for everyone like it's all athletes are in the same situation regardless of where you are in the sport but like everyone's in a similar situation and i'll always always pick my health over my sport like the health of me and the people around me is always going to be way more important. And I think I've always just tried to make it like, I, I guess I've made it easy for myself. because so I've accepted if it doesn't happen, it's okay that it doesn't happen because there's more important things happening in the world right now. And, you know, you have to just put things into perspective. I'm like, as much as I love my sport and I've trained my whole life, I want the rest of my life and I want the rest of my family's life to be like as good as it can be. So if we have to make what is relatively a small sacrifice in maybe not having Olympics, then, I'll take that to be able to, you know, the world get back to normal and everyone be able to do all the things they love. Like it's, I'm not sure how many athletes would agree with that, but I feel like there's much more important things in the world if you have to put them in a priority list. If it happens, I'll be ready for it to happen. But if it doesn't, because, you know, what's going on, then we just have to accept that. Absolutely.
Um, I, I'm almost done. So I'm, I'm, I'll call from a, a couple more questions from uh, the people who have put them in chat. Uh, Becky Hilton, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? I think that's a, a great question that I haven't asked. What, the second one? Yes. Um, who is your inspiration for trampolining currently? Currently? Can, uh, I, also, can I also add in, uh, who was your uh, inspiration as you were as you were coming through? So there, okay. there's, there's two, two people to that. Well, actually, there's three. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie Moore, hands down, I wanted her set. She was, I just love watching her. She just made trampoline look so easy, so graceful, and, like, I just wanted to be her. Like, she was, for those of you who don't know, our first Olympian. Um, she, yeah, her, hands down, she was my idol growing up, um, like, in GB. Tatiana Petrinia was always my my idol internationally. Everyone else always picked like other people and everyone's like, oh, I don't know why you want to be like her, but just something about her drew me in. I loved watching her and I just thought she was great. Um, and then she won her first world title at 36. I mean, you know, what better idol could you want? Um, but currently it'll be Rosie, easy. Rosie McClendon, she is the most lovable person you could ever meet. Like the most normal, down to earth, just... Like you would never like meet her, speak to her, and know that she's a double Olympian. Like she is just a great person. Like I don't know. I don't. I don't really know how to describe her. Like when you don't know her, it's like she's she's just so down to earth and so just grounded and chill and but focused and oh, she's just a dude. And then when like when pressure's on, she just delivers all the time. Like all the time. <laughs> Like, like she hadn't trained loads before Rio because she had bad concussion for like 12 to 18 months. Like really, really struggled with it. Rocks up to the games. When it counts, boom, wins. Like she's just... And I have a good story about Rosie, actually. When we were kids, she's a year or two years younger than me. We went to the Flanders Cup one year and um, we'd gone to, we got into the final. Amanda Parker had won. Rosie had come second and I'd come third. And we were walking out and Rosie came running up to me. I'd never really met her or spoken to her. And she was like, oh my God, I, like they've made a mistake. They've put my tariff up wrong. Like this, my difficulty's wrong. Like you should have beaten me, but they won't take the medal back because they said the medal's already taken. But I like, I don't, like you beat me. Like it, it's wrong. So she was like, we need to swap medals. So she made a point of us swapping medals because she knew that what well, they, like when they looked at the results, they realized their difficulty was wrong. They hadn't noticed at the time. And everyone's like, it's too late. Presentations have happened now. Like the result stands. But she wouldn't take it because she she didn't feel right that that's what happened and that was when we were like fourteen swap medals with me and that's just that's rosy that's so that's she so she went away with the bronze medal and you, and she gave you her silver medal yeah wow even though the result will always show the other way round she said she couldn't leave with the medal because it's not right she didn't win that she won a bronze the dude. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a round of applause. That is kind of rosy, and so imagine that. And she's never changed after winning Olympic medals and stuff. Like she is just so down to earth. Uh, Emily from Sky High, uh, do you want to unmute and ask your question about rivalry? <laughs> interesting to go from a really uh, interesting question about camaraderie to uh, a question about rivalry. Who is your Who is your biggest rival currently? Currently. Like nationally or internationally? What do you want both? Um, Let's do both. That sounds like a good yeah. idea. Well, nationally, I'd like it's not even a both thing. Like between me, Laura, and Brian, it's just like a fight all the time. Like we are each other's biggest rivals, but we're also each other's biggest supporters. Um, so it's obviously going to be between us because we we know going into competition, we don't know what order we're going to finish. It literally could be in any order, depending on who does what on the day. Um, so they'd be my biggest rivals, without a doubt. Like, there's no hiding that. Um, internationally, I mean, where do I start? Uh, probably like Rosie's the one that everyone watches out for because you just never know what she's going to do. She doesn't necessarily like for all the World Cups and stuff. She's not necessarily going to be the star, but a major championship, you know, she's going to turn up. Um, but the little the Japanese probably at the moment are the ones that are kind of have been coming up the most and kind of come from nowhere and suddenly started beating everyone. So they probably are our big team rivals. Oh, that was a brilliant question, Emily. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to uh, ask my final question and then we're going to sign off because we've, we've well, well dipped over our hour. I do apologise, Kat. Okay. Um, uh, Harriet, you asked about um, downtime. So if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned about, you know, everything being quite stressful and 
uh, not ne never knowing when the next time competition is coming at the moment. So what are you doing to switch off? Um, I am currently reading. I am on my 33rd book of the year. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't watch an awful lot of TV. I found last year, I've been kind of playing around a little bit, obviously, through lockdown to figure out, you know, what works. It was easy last year when it was nice and warm. We were going out for loads of walks and going out for loads of runs and all that kind of stuff. Um, since I got back into full-time training, I started finding that every time I turned on the TV, everything was negative. It was There didn't seem to be anything, like, fun, uplifting and positive on the TV. Don't get me wrong. I watch all the sport and stuff that's on the TV. That's a bit different. Um, but I don't really watch an awful lot of TV anymore. I found that really draining and really kind of... I don't know. I just never felt motivated after the TV or started feeling like there was loads of negativity around. So I got into reading. I mean, I've always been a bookworm, but I mean, I've been bad this year. Um, so yeah, I've been reading. I'm reading loads of different stuff to just take me to a different place. So I don't read the same kind of thing the whole time. And I've steered away from reading. I used to always read sports biographies. They were my favourite thing ever because you could always relate to something in it or learn something from other athletes. And I always found that really fascinating. But I've tried to stay away from that so that I can stay in my own sport bubble, but can go away to another place with a, with a different book. So I've read, yeah, all kinds of different stuff I'm currently reading, which is a great one. Why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. So this is kind of educating myself on some stuff. And then also I've read like some romances, some horrors, some thrillers, some murders. So yeah, that's a really long-winded way to just say, I'm designing leotards. But yeah, they're the only kind of things that I've kind of been sticking to. Play cards every so often. Um, uh, I hear that Kat holds a, uh, a, a weekly poker night every Thursday. £50 buy-in. <laughs> I was thinking, what have you heard? <laughs> I do not do that, everyone. That is a lie. <laughs> and I'd also be terrible at it as well. So I wouldn't be winning any money. Yeah, brilliant question, Harriet. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, you okay, so finally, oh, sorry, say that again, Kat. Any book recommendations? Let me know because I've like I said, I've read quite a few. So I keep looking around randomly just because I'm looking at them. They're either side of them. So with with every accolade box uh, available to a trampoline athlete, well and truly pff, ticked. Um, are are you still hungry? Um, or you know, what what is there that's left to come from Kat Driscoll? This year. Not really a lot, is there? It's not really a lot of options. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I guess, like, the, a lot of people keep asking, like, why I still train or compete like the age I am. Um, and I've always just said that I'll do it for as long as I enjoy it. I get up in, in the morning and I feel like there's something I can go and do to challenge myself. I actually had to do an interview with British Massics recently. Um, I'm doing some work on the culture. And the guy said to me, um, why do you trampoline? Like, tell me why you do it. And I was like... Well, tell me somewhere else in life I can get the challenge physically and mentally every single day where I can test my body, find the boundaries, can get bouts of adrenaline, can smile the whole time, can be frustrated, can be overwhelmed with how much I can make a difference in the tiniest body movement or the tiniest placement of a hand or a finger or so, you know, something just like really stupid. Like what else in life is going to give me that? And until there's a moment where I don't feel like there's a challenge for me or I don't have a fire to be better or don't want to push those boundaries anymore. Like for me, that's the time to like, call it a day. And I've always wanted to, can't control this, but always wanted to walk away knowing that I've walked away at a time where I've done everything I've wanted to do and I've enjoyed it and I've walked away with my head held high. Like you can't control if you get a, like, so a career ending injury, all those kinds of things. But I've always wanted to walk away when I've been ready to walk away because I've done everything I want to do and I don't have the fire anymore. I, I think that's the question, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's, I suppose, all good things have to come to an end at some point, don't they? Have you, uh, have you started thinking about what uh, your plans are post trampolining? You know, once, once retirement finally does catch up with this uh, feminine effigy Peter Pan character that we're uh, we're enjoying watching so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to coach. Um, I want to, but kind of like. So I did um, last, oh God, I'm so confused for years now. At some point recently, I did um, a UK sport athlete to coach program. Um, and there were 16 of us across different sports in the UK that have either people that have just retired or you could still be an athlete if you were looking at retiring kind of soon. Um, so I think there's only me and one other athlete that was still currently 
competing and everyone else has recently retired um, and you go through the course learning all the different things that you don't look because obviously being like a work on athlete you learn so many things along the way that you can transfer into coaching but there's other things you obviously don't learn so I did like a I think it was 18 months two years course on that and it was absolutely incredible so all I know 100% is I want to do something in sport when I've retired ideally in trampoline because it's a sport that I've been passionate about since I was a little kid um, and it's the one I feel like I know the most about so my like my number one plan would be some kind of national coach on a junior role somewhere along those lines because I feel like there's not many of our coaches we've got out there that have actually been through it as well and know what it's like to do the competing the training the conditioning the body like the recovery and all that kind of stuff I feel like I've got that side of it that I can help the gymnast with as well so that's kind of where I'm at, at the moment is that's kind of what I'm trying to I've been going through all my different qualifications and stuff um so I just needed to sit my level three exam, which we couldn't do because you couldn't go near anyone to do anything. So I'm kind of stuck with that at the moment. Um, but yeah, the plan is to somehow stay involved in in the sport in whatever way is possible. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Well, uh, uh, on that note, I'm going to draw our interview to a close. Um, and I think that your, your aspirations for staying within the sport... Mm, Brilliant. And, and we absolutely want to look forward to uh, enjoy watching you again for as long as, uh, as you're still having fun. Um, and as far as what happens afterwards, I've got my fingers and I'm sure everybody else has that you're going to uh, smash all of your goals out the back door. And it's going to be a, a, another side of your amazing career that we're going to look forward to, to watching. So, yeah, good luck with all that, my lovely. Thank you. Thank you for everyone's questions as well. Yeah, no, for, from all of you guys who have participated tonight, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. I'll tell you what, it's been absolutely brilliant um, hosting this event. Um, and uh, most importantly, thank you so much to you, Kat, for, for taking the time out of your schedule to come and spend uh, the evening with all of us. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that I speak for everybody. I've had a lovely time. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's been it's been super cool. Um, should we should we see if we can't make this work, guys? Everyone, unmute yourselves, and then we're going to give her a massive round of applause. Woo! <laughs> like everyone's videos are popping up at different times. <laughs> oh gosh, Cat, uh, thank you so much, my lovely, um, and to all of you, uh, I bid thee farewell. I hope that you've enjoyed this evening. Have a lovely uh, rest of your evening. Have a lovely week next week. Have a lovely rest of lockdown, and let's hope that it doesn't last too long. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Bye.